So I got introduced to mindfulness meditation, which is just being with yourself. First and foremost, we feel better. Uh, there's no there's no resistance because we're being with what is. So there's a pleasant experience. Practicing meditation and mindfulness meditation, I would recommend. Nicholas Cassius Clay is the founder of Being One World LLC, a mindfulness company that helps professionals become their most powerful expression of themselves while maintaining a clear and a balanced state of mind. Nick's ultimate goal is to increase awareness of mindfulness due to its power of healing the mind, creating healthy relationships, and building strong community. I was recently introduced to Nick from Christine Smith, who is a business partner of mine, as well as who's been on the show several times now. If you haven't checked out our episodes together, go check them out. We talk about the power of networking and networking and the power of it is how Nick and I became friends. We've had several conversations. He's local to upstate New York. We met and grabbed coffee. And let me tell you, Nick is a great man. He practices what he talks about and he's just a stand-up guy. I know you'll enjoy the conversation together. If you take even one piece of value away from this conversation with Mr. Clay, then please share this show with just one other person. We're not going to show you an ad. We're not going to show you a sponsor. We don't want to interrupt your viewing experience, and we've only grown the way that we have over the last two years because you're the best part of the Be Better team. So thank you for sharing the show. Without further ado, Mr. Nick Cassius Clay, it's great to have you on the show, my friend. Yeah, it's great to be on. I'm excited and uh, ready to roll. I'm ready to talk to you. We had a deep conversation on Common Grounds in Saratoga Springs. And you don't, you don't always meet people. I know we had a conversation before, but you don't always just like jump right into the deeper conversations with a lot of people. It's always like the small talk. But you, you brought it right to the deep place. We talked about relationships and we talked about love and we talked about uh, people in our lives who are special. And we talked about a lot of different things. So I'm curious to know from you, when people ask you, what does mindfulness even mean? How, how would you define mindfulness to the everyday person? Yeah, I, I start really with what mindfulness is, and that's being present. Uh, and it sounds simple, and it is. Uh, what's not simple is what pulls us out of being present will pulls us away from being here. So if someone asks me what mindfulness is, I, I start really with the, with the lighter uh, understanding of it, which is being here completely in the now uh, with our surroundings and internally within our internal experience. So when you talk about being present in the moment now, for the person listening or watching, that would mean they're looking at the screen or if they're walking, listening to this, or if they're at the gym, listening to this, they're engaged in their environment in this moment. They can look down, they can see that they have hands, they can look in front of them and they can see the elliptical machine or they can look around and they can see the trees and they can think in their mind, I am present in this moment right now. So is there a way, and I know that this is maybe a strange question, but what is like the present moment compared to what? Yeah, uh, so another way you can think of it as uh, thought distances us from the present. So if we're in thought, we're distorting the present reality. So this, it's, it's getting to the point of understanding that time is a concept and there really is no future. You know, like we're never going to touch the future. Anything that ever happens is always happening now. And we're never going to change the past. So it's that realization of realizing we're here right now. And then secondly, understanding that our, when we're thinking, we're pulling ourselves out of being present. So it's, it's having a complete awareness, which awareness being that, that sense, that, that noticing of everything that is now. And I know that's sounding redundant. However, you know, it's a simple concept, yet there's such a complexity to it, it seems like at least. And it's definitely been a journey for me to, to practice this and get here. And I'm still, you know, I wouldn't put myself anywhere near, you know, monks that have really mastered being here. So but you're many steps ahead of the person in the previous version of yourself who didn't understand this idea of mindfulness. And I want to talk about your story, but we're in the moment now. Okay. Like I'm here with you. I'm focused on this conversation with you. The people listening are focused on this as well as what they're doing. What is the value of being in the present moment? What is the value on 
not looking ahead or not looking into the past and thinking about what's already happened or what's going to happen. What's the value on being in this moment? Yeah. First and foremost, we feel better. Uh, there's no, there's no resistance because we're being with what is. So there's a pleasant experience. The second thing is it brings an increased clarity and focus to being with what is. Uh, if we're, if we're thinking about something in the future, and then we're trying to navigate something that's right in front of us. We're less capable to navigate what's in front of us because we're being distracted. It's uh, it's like driving while you're on the phone. You're, you're not going to be as good as a driver if you're trying to multitask, which we can't literally do, uh, while you're looking at the phone. So it's the same thing about if you – probably one of the better analogies. You think of the vehicle and a car, distraction as the phone. Well, vehicle is our body, our system. And distraction is our thought. So it's like trying to navigate the present moment, drive your car while trying to search up something on your phone or read something on your phone. You're constantly looking back and forth, back and forth. Got it. Yeah. So when we're in that present moment, what if the present moment for someone is a painful moment? What if someone just experienced a breakup? What if someone recently got let go of their job and now they're in the present moment and they're, okay, so again, I, I think I'm answering my own question. Then the thoughts come in while they're on the couch or while they're doing whatever they're doing of I'm alone, I'm jobless, I don't have much going on for me right now. Like what if the present moment isn't an ideal moment or does a non-ideal moment exist when you are truly living in the present? Great question. Mindfulness doesn't make problems go away. It gives us a clearer view to be with it. So first and foremost, the second thing, so you go through a breakup or you lose a job. It's also understanding. So this goes to the deeper in my coaching, understanding what's actually possible. For example, emotions, you know, we think a breakup needs to take us, you know, hours, days, weeks, months, years to get over, which is not true. It's a resistance to us actually processing and accepting what has happened. So we start living in a past, resisting what is. And a natural emotion only lasts about 90 seconds. Anything other than that, we are adding fuel to the fire within our own thoughts, with our, within our own resistance of it. And I'm not saying it's easy. Like, oh, if you cry for two hours, you know, you're not, it, it's not easy. I mean, I, I went through something that I released a couple weeks ago that I shared with you when we were having coffee and I had resistance to it because I was making myself wrong. It was quite challenging and it was a lot of hours of crying. However, when we realize what processing is, the duration can, can be severely reduced of us experiencing these unpleasant experiences and realizing this is when we get into the span of consciousness there's a lower mind and there's a higher mind and one of the states in our higher mind is is accepting and when we can get to that place of accepting it doesn't mean you get the job back however it's a higher benefit and a higher performance the, the quicker we can accept what happened so we can be with i don't have a job now the next thing what can i do about it mm. as opposed to you know, and I'm exaggerating here, and I'm sure this happens for some people, you know, crying in the house or the apartment for a week. Well, that's six days more longer than maybe someone who got to acceptance needed to break down. And then maybe by the end of the week, they have another job. So we, we exacerbate the, the situation by resisting it. Doesn't mean it's easier. However, we can have a, a heightened ability to be with it and then grow and learn from it. And as you grow and learn from Mistakes like a heartbreak or a job, and, and maybe mistake is, is not the accurate word for a heartbreak, just you know, from a compatibility that wasn't there, then you're going to grow and look forward to the next one because you learn from that relationship. You learn what worked and didn't work, and now you can be more powerful going into the next one, and your vetting or filtration system is improved. That gives you a higher opportunity that the next time you get close with someone, it's it's going to have a higher likelihood of working out because you learned from the past one. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. In a very, in a very great way. I mean, it's very, <laughs> it's very empowering to recognize the very first part is it's empowering to recognize that you are in the present moment. It takes conscious awareness to be able to say, this is the moment in quote unquote time that I am experiencing right now, because even like, 
all the time with me. Like I'll go a few hours or even more. Sometimes I'll go half the day or maybe even more and then stop for a second and realize I'm present right now, but I wasn't present the entire day. Like I wasn't even aware of me living out my entire day. And this is especially true when I'm doing a lot of the clockwork things that I'm so used to doing, but it's very empowering to be in that moment. And let's say we are in a painful moment and let's face it, we all experience painful moments, right? It's all about the meaning that we attach to it. But there are moments throughout each of our weeks where we experience a hardship or a difficulty. And if you're in that present moment, you have a couple options okay, you can look back and realize what you did wrong, what they did wrong, how you were wronged in general. Or you can be in that moment and like you said, ask a more powerful question. Be in that moment and accept it for what it is. This is what it is. This is the reality I'm in right now. Maybe it's not fair. Maybe it's not right, justified, whatever it is. But it's powerful to be able to say, what's next? What happens after? this moment. And a lot of the times, at least for myself, and maybe those listening will agree, maybe you'll agree. Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. I don't know what's next. I could do a lot of different things. Well, then the question can be, what do I want to happen? How do I want to be living my life? We talked for a while about creating that dream reality. We talked for a while about what you specifically want your lifestyle to look like with what it is you do and the freedom that you can enjoy with doing what you do, right? And you like to help other people experience that freedom as well. And let me say, it's very clear to me when I talk with you, Nick, that you love what you do. You love mindfulness. You love helping people become more present. You love helping people in general. And you dove into this topic. Like you're constantly researching and reading and learning more. And my question for you is how did you come across this as the obsession that it has now become? How did this happen for you in your life? Yeah, I started with self-development, which I look back at it now. It amazes me that that was such a unknown and unseen concept. And so I started reading self-development books and I became a little bit of a self-development junkie. I thought it was amazing how you could invest into yourself and improve yourself. And at the time I was in finance and I knew the person I was starting was not going to be the person that was going to be successful. It just wasn't going to happen that way. So I knew I had to improve. And then through self-improvement and networking and being focused on building a successful network, what does that mean? I wanted to be surrounded by other people that were where I wanted to be, a high net worth, business owners, because those are different conversations. So I wanted to learn from what that conversation sounds like. You can learn so much from just being in conversations with people. And I've learned that most people really are there to support you to the best of their ability. And one of those conversations led to a recommendation to read A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. And I was surprised on the interest that this person showed me because at the time I was delivering packages. I didn't think much of my society status. And here's this successful business owner who's taken the time to talk to me, you know, at the same level, he never looked down on me. And when I read that book, life made sense to me for the first time ever. So much of things I would disagree with, or people would give me answers, not that they were lying, it just felt like it wasn't a complete understanding. And this book started to answer questions and, and give light on deeper wonders that I had for a really long time. I mean, I've been asking deep questions since I was five, six years old, as I can remember. And then I started practicing it. And it was an experience I had practicing one of the modalities that Eckhart Tolle teaches, where I was in a situation that I was frustrated. You know, I was a little, you know, in an intensity of anger. And I knew that was a perfect opportunity to give this this work uh, a test. You know, what better way than to authentically feel a negative emotion and say, okay, well, if this is supposed to take me out of it, let's see how it works. And it was the first time I learned and experienced what choosing acceptance was. And I went from frustration to a smile and I laughed for about the next 30 minutes. I couldn't even believe what was happening. I thought, this is, this is wild that this just happened. And I couldn't even make myself mad again. I couldn't even get frustrated at the situation again. And that's when I learned how much power we have within ourselves and, you know, now that it's, it's funny, I haven't thought about this in a long time because it, it was actually the sentence that empowered me 
And of course, I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember it that well. Eckhart Tolle taught, we well, were talking about the ego and, and the pain body and what we cause in ourselves. And something he said that made me understand that we do it to ourselves. And that woke me up a little bit. And I thought, oh, well, I know I can't control other people. However, if you're telling me that I'm doing all this to myself, well, yeah, I'll look at me. I'll work on me. That's an easier task. It's much harder to try to control other people. So is when I got one of the chapters, he said something like that pretty directly, at least how I understood it. When he said that it's us that's doing it to us, that empowered me. And I thought, okay, well, let's do it. I'm willing to practice whatever you tell me to do. And that's what I did. And I became obsessed. And then it was book after book after book. I couldn't get enough. And then I started learning how much we actually do understand about the mind. However, not a lot of people put them all together. There's all these different silos of, you know, whether it's spirituality, whether, you know, even pieces in religion, whether it's ontology, whether it's the chakras, uh, whether it's neuroscience, whether it's neuroplasticity, you have all these different little areas of understanding. And what I started realizing is when you start putting these together, they, 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 there's a lot of overlapping being told in different perspectives. And so I just, instead of looking for the right answer, I started researching what everybody else was saying and using it together. And it's, it's, that's essentially how I got into, uh, into the work here. And like you said, I'm still always constantly researching. There's always a book I'm reading. I have literally 15 books on my living floor right now. Like I, I will not run out of material. And I do that also so I can be one of the best coaches that a client will ever sit down with. And when I come across a new issue with a client, I immediately go to that subject and I start researching what that particular area looks like. And then I come back and then we start making progress. Yeah, it's very clear how passionate you are on this topic. And a lot of people, including myself, I've read a couple mindfulness books. I've read like maybe a half of A New Earth and it was a fascinating book. And uh, The Power of Now is another great one. And that is, uh, is that also Eckhart Tolle? It is. And they're near the same. The Power of Now is written more like a, a, a back and forth conversation. And A New Earth is, is more story mode. They, they are identical information. I'd say about 90%. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, and what you said was so impactful. You took all these different ideas and strategies from all these different readings. And the most important thing is you applied them. And you grabbed this one where it made sense and you grabbed this one, you grabbed that one and you've created a conglomeration and really your own strategy as a result of all the other learnings that you've taken in. You've really made it your own. So my question is, this is where you are now in this present moment. Let's talk about you at the beginning of this journey where you said, I have a desire to be more present in my daily life. I can only imagine it was more difficult then than it is now because you've built up this muscle over time. But can you walk me through maybe some ways that those listening and watching can practice mindfulness in a practical way in their daily life? One of the best ways to practice uh, is meditation. Uh, again, mindfulness at its, at its focal point, it's so simple. The complexity, again, is what which takes us out of the present. So practicing meditation and mindfulness meditation, I would recommend. And I say that because there's different types of meditations. Uh, you know, there's, there's what they call it, transcendental meditation where you have mantras. Uh, there's guided meditations, which I do for people. People enjoy that. There's meditations where you have sound in the background. When I got introduced to meditation, which again was by Eckhart Tolle, I didn't know about all these other areas of meditation. So I got introduced to mindfulness meditation, which is just being with yourself. And so I started meditating out in parks in between appointments. This was pre-COVID. Uh, so if I had a gap or someone canceled, I'd find a park, I'd set my timer, and I would just learn how to get behind my thoughts. And I recommend that so highly because it gives us a focus on nothing. And if you can focus on nothing, then you can focus on anything. Wow. So if you start, if you start building that muscle to just be, then when you start having these reactions in the world, what you learn how to do is get yourself back behind the thoughts. And that's going to alleviate because it's the thoughts that create the, 
the the issues, the 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 negative energy within us. It's not the it's not the silence. It's not the being with. And then when we can get to the silence, then we can be aware of our experience and be with that. And and and, and then there's a processing of it. And then the next step is to look at the judgment that we're having on ourselves. And when you can start removing that judgment, seeing our own humanity, well, then the emotion processes and you'll, you'll feel it go through your system. And essentially that's mindfulness meditation is a practice of holding enlightenment, which, you know, is not a mythical place. Enlightenment is, is awareness void of judgment. It's objective observation. Truly. I always say it's seeing a tree without calling it a tree quieting the mind that's what enlightenment is that's what monks that will meditate one to three hours in the morning one to three hours in the evening that's what they're building that muscle of and then what happens is you can start getting the muscle you can start getting the mind to quiet itself whenever you would like so that's you know really that is the most practical exercise we can do and i will say this because like for a lot of my clients i'll give homework of 10 to 15 10 to 15 minutes meditation which is which is nothing in the world of practicing meditation. Yet that's such a struggle for most people in this distractive uh, world that we live in today. And for anyone who would want to tell me, oh, I don't have time for that. You know what I'm saying? I got a busy schedule. I don't care if you have seven kids and five spouses and 20 siblings. If you say you don't have time for meditation, I can tell you what, anytime during the day, if you got to take a number two, you got time. <laughs> if you got time for that to happen, then you have time to do one of the simplest yet challenging things for your mind that is most likely one of the most beneficial mental exercises we could ever practice and will yield, in my opinion, one of the greatest benefits to living life or, or at least handling the added weight of what life is nowadays and the responsibility, especially if you do have you know, kids and, you know, it's joking, of course, on the spouses and everything. Uh, you know, if you do have a lot going on in your life, it's going to allow you a larger capacity to be with that. And that's going to help you. And then you'll see that, oh, I didn't, I didn't know navigating four kids could be a little, a little bit easier. I didn't know I didn't have to be stressed out by 2 p.m. Yeah, I was just looking up because I know that there's so many different studies on mindfulness in school, specifically in schools where there's a lot of fighting between the students, whether it's inner city schools or whatever it might be, there's been a lot of research done on when a meditation practice is employed in these environments. It just, the, the fights go down, grades go up, satisfaction of being there goes up. I mean, and like you said, you don't have to be in the world's most quiet environment. You can be in an environment with seven kids and still practice this idea of mindfulness that you just stated. At the beginning, you're going to be aware but still judging, you might look at the tree and you might say, oh, that's a, that's an old tree. Or you might look at your kid and be like, wow, he's being really loud right now or whatever it is. But then you can realize, oh, that was a thought. That was a thought. That was a thought. And like what you said, getting behind the thoughts as the objective with this exercise is so powerful because really if you then deduce who we in essence really are, it is that force or that entity that is observing the thought. So the question then, and I'm curious to hear what you think. The question is, if we aren't the thoughts that just pop in, pop in here, pop in here, like my wife will have the same thoughts as me sometimes, especially because we're, we're on such similar vibrations at this point. We've been together for over 11 years. So if she's having the same thoughts as me, are we really our thoughts? And if the question, if the answer is no, then if we're not our thoughts, then, then what are we and who are we? So what we are is the awareness of our thoughts. Who we are is whoever we choose or decide to be. And so I'll make a note there, choosing and deciding are not one and the same. However, it, regardless of how you come about the who, you know, our, our who is merely a thought in itself. It's thought thinking itself outside of what it actually is. And you look at how we start developing this who. We come into the world and usually we're giving it we're given a name so we identify with that which that is just a thought and then on top of that maybe we have a race religious background maybe a sports team so then we identify with that political party so these are all layers that we start building that once upon a time we're not there 
yet they were built up into thought of I am blank. The truth is what we are is the awareness of our thoughts. Who we are when we can raise our vibration and, and, and understand that we are creating ourselves. Who we are can be whoever we want to be. When we, when we unlock that aspect of our mind, just like who I am today is not the same person that had a who, you know, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, I was fighting on the basketball court because I was a basketball player. And if somebody challenged that, you know, it was something I easily got offended by. And there was all this talk that happens on the court and you, you know, you, you work to get inside of other players' heads. And today, I would never would never get in a fight on the court. It's just not that reactive part of me. That that identity that I am a basketball player, I am an athlete, has been removed. And for my personal, you know, what I've found and what I've worked on is that you don't have to say I am a basketball player to be able to play basketball. You can say I am a person who plays basketball. Mm -hmm. And that in itself will remove any offense that you would take if someone challenged on the basketball. And that's just, you know, something I grew up a lot doing. You can do that with any sport, any profession. Uh, we start to identify ourselves by what we do. That's another big one right there. Yeah. You, you look at teachers as a big one and you, and you get such an emotional connection to teaching. And then a lot of teachers, when they retire, they don't know who they are anymore. Mm. Yeah. Once upon a time, they were not a teacher. So that's an identity that you can see got created. And anyone with their profession right now listening can probably see that within themselves. You created a part of your identity when you got into a career, especially one that you got emotionally attached to and you see yourself doing long term. Yet you don't have to be a who in that career. You can be a person that does that. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you this. Is there more value in attaching to a specific identity, such as the teacher example, or is there more value in detaching from that identity? Being someone who says, I am a person who teaches versus someone who says, I'm a teacher and I'm damn good at it. Like, where is there more value? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that comes down to every single person's set of values. I, I, I can't say for every person, you know, I'm coming from my biasness. And what I think what's valuable is having inner peace. And I've always craved freedom. And having full autonomy of my system. I find that most valuable. However, I've also learned recently that not everyone's focused on the same value. Not, not everyone's focused on happiness. That's not everyone's primary goal, which I, I found surprising, uh, which is just part of learning and discovering other people. So the first thing is I would offer is what is, what is, what are people truly looking for? What's valuable for, for yourself? And then we can look at is, how your identity is constructed, is that serving that? Mm. So yes. that's, so that gets a little tricky. That's I, It comes down to each individual person. I don't think I could say what's most valuable without taking an 8 billion person survey. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Maybe one day. Yeah. Like As an example, if I'm getting surgery done, I would much prefer the surgeon who's working on my brain to say, I'm a surgeon. I'm the best surgeon. This is what I've been doing. I have 99% success rate. This is my identity. This is who I am. Then the person who says, I am a person who performs surgery. Like yeah. that would be like, mm, I don't necessarily know. But again, like you said, I think the people who do become the world-class surgeon probably are the people who hyper identify with being that. So I think it depends on like what you said, the person, but even more importantly, what does that person want like what what do they want their experience of life if your experience of life is you love to derive significance and you value significance and importance above all then that's okay number one and number two it's very likely that you do heavily identify with what it is you do or who it is you are or who you believe yourself to be that's where the whole idea of ego comes into play right ego in a way and correct me if, with what you believe here but Ego to me is like you on the basketball court 15 years ago. It was you defending the fact or projecting the fact that you are a basketball player and you are a really good basketball player at that. Is there value in that ego or does it do more harm than good? Yeah. So as you're saying that what I can offer more, well, one, one correction there. So belief is something, and this is might get uh, confronting here. However, something I came across Belief is not something I subscribe to. 
And I, so I don't hold that because belief creates a cage in the mind. And again, I value freedom and, 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 and full openness of what I can expand to think of. And belief takes away our ability to think about what it is we believe in. Mm. The second thing coming back to I am and going back to your value question and this question is what I what I would propose is the most valuable thing to to remember. So if you read spiritual books, a lot of this talks about remembering and we forget we have this forgotten of who we are or what we are. Is you can be I am to whatever it is and it definitely can serve a good value. However, remember that it was constructed in the first place. So that way, when you do retire as that world-class surgeon, you do retire that teacher that worked for 40 years in the system, you can understand that that was one possibility of your expression of a person. And then when that chapter has closed, you're not left with this, who am I now? Because you remember that who you are is the possibility to create who you are. Yeah. And so then it allows you an opening to say, you know what, I was a world-class surgeon and that was so valuable for me and I was happy to be that. And that was who I used to create myself as. And then you can ask yourself the question when you retire from being that world-class surgeon, who do I want to be now? Mm. See, because if you forget that it was created in the first place, then what happens is you retire as a world-class surgeon, yet your mind still says, I am a surgeon. So now you have a cognitive dissonance. Because yeah. you say I'm a world-class surgeon, yet you're not doing surgery. So now mm. you don't feel like you are who you say you are, and that's troubling for the mind. However, if you remember that it was created, then the moment you retire, you can have a look within yourself and willingly and peacefully let that go, understand that was a great time, and now oh, I get a whole new blank canvas. Who do I want to create myself as now? Wow. Just like you did before when you created that first identity. And the thing is, a lot of times that first identity was created due to the circumstances that were available to you at that time. You got the promotion. The promotion came up in the first place for you to apply for. You took it. And then over time, you built that identity. And I think it's important to realize that while you can just come out and say, well, I am this now and choose something different, that new identity will likely be born after a time of putting in different actions and new activities. So it, it can take time to build that new identity because like what you said, if you don't have those actions that back up the identity, then there's that cognitive dissonance there of you not actually doing the thing that is required for you to say that you are that specific thing. Yeah. And, and then you can uh, experience a lot of where imposter syndrome comes in because we're not actually resonating with what we say we are, or we add contingencies to what we are. So you could say, I'm a world-class surgeon, yet underneath that could be a contingency of if I perform five successful surgeries a week. So if you're only performing two, you'll feel like you're not living up to what you say you are. Because again, a lot of us will have contingencies on what it means to be what it is. So that gets into another layer of how the identity can be constructed. Great point. Let me ask you more about that idea of happiness. And you said it it strikes me as crazy when people's goal isn't happiness. So you mentioned to me at Uncommon Grounds the study that Harvard did on happiness. Can you give us an idea of what the study was and, and what they deduced from that and how you, what you took away from that? Yeah, so the study started, and so don't 100% quote me. I'm, I'm in the ballpark here. It started like 1943, I want to say. 67 yeah i think like 1943 around there they started with 200 and like 60 something participants and it concluded in 2015 so not too long ago so it was like 70 something years longest study on human happiness ever conducted uh they ended up so even though they started with 200 and change they ended up with over a thousand people because as they started doing this study year after year after year the spouses then wanted to be included they said, hey, how come you don't interview us? How come you don't talk to us? So they started including spouses and they started including the children. And so that's how the, the participant size grew. And that was what they are measuring. What, what was creating human happiness from people from different walks of life. And they found, and, and you know, I've looked into this deeper. I cannot find a number two. And I'm not sure if it's because there's not, maybe I haven't looked deep enough or just number one was just so far of a standout from what two could have been. 
uh, and, and maybe two was a tie between seven other things. The number one contributor, though, to human happiness came down to the quality of relationships that people had in their lives. And what I took from that, when I learned that, because that, that was my biggest, that's been my biggest focus in life, to be happy. And when I learned that, I became, it increased my focus on having a healthy relationship with every single person in my life. And what that means is not having anything negative between us to the best of my ability. And since then, I, to the best of what I'm aware of, have cleared up anything that at least was in my space negatively with people in my life. And if there's still something there, I am more than open and happy to allow anyone to share with me what's in their space because it's only going to allow us to be closer. Uh, so that's, that's about the study. That's what I personally took away from. So I'm, I'm heightenedly, uh, uh, I have a heightened importance on my connection with each and every person. And through my experience, it has occurred to me in my experience that every relationship in our life really does matter. And if you have something negative between somebody, even if they're no longer in your life or you think that's, you know, you're over it, it's not true. We store our negative energy in our system until it's processed. Mm -hmm. And so I have reached out to people that, that aren't in my life anymore. However, something transpired that I didn't feel right about. And I've cleared myself with every person I could possibly think of and influence from that, from that study. Uh, and some conversations were easier than others. That's when you kind of, you know, the karma of it, you have to come back and, and kind of own how you were being. And I wasn't always the nicest person or I didn't always do things in the most mindful way. So that gets a little tough to be with. Uh, I find that you, you grow a lot from that though. And you become a more powerful self from that. What, what I appreciate most about that, and I pulled up the study here. I'm going to share the screen in a second just for those listening because I find it to be a very impactful study in general, especially over the, the course of time that they did it, is what I love most about what you said is when you did have that disconnect with someone who did mean something to you, you don't try to change that person. You focused on you changing and you growing and you improving, right? We talked before about not meeting the person at the vibrational level or the emotional level that they're at, that like what you mentioned, if they're in anger, then you're not going to just meet that person in anger just to meet them, right? You're going to maintain the quote unquote higher ground, not out of ego, but in an attempt to help that person, which I want to talk to you about here in a second. But this is the study for those who are watching, you'll be able to see it. If not, then I'll explain it. An 85 year Harvard study found the number one thing that makes us happy in life. And it helps us to live longer. So in 1938, Harvard embarked on a decade long study decades long to find out what makes us happy. This was with a sample group of 724 participants all around the world who were asked detailed questions about their life at two year intervals. It's not career achievement. It's not money. It's not exercise or a healthy diet. They say that the number one key to a happy life is social fitness. Relationships affect us physically. Ever notice the invigoration that you feel when you believe someone has really understood you during a good conversation? To make sure your relationships are healthy and balanced, it's important to practice social fitness. Our social life is a living system and it needs exercise. Very fascinating study. I, I, I mean, when you look at the people, and I think we talked about this too, when you look at the people who live the longest, it's the people who were in the blue zones, they call them, right? The centenarians where there's a lot of people who are living over a hundred years old. They all do very similar things. A couple of those things are they eat real foods, not processed stuff. They move frequently. They're always in motion, doing something with their body, but above all, they have a sense of community and they have that social fitness. They're talking with the people they love. They're developing their relationships. It's when you're alone and you're isolated that your lifespan decreases, your happiness decreases, you lose that sense of purpose. And really, it's funny that we had to do a study on this, Nick, because, I mean, if you look back millions of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years, whatever it might be, we were in tribes, we were always with people. It's only now in this modern world that we can live alone and not socialize and do everything from our phone and work remotely and really not interact with people unless we choose to. So I agree. That's a powerful study, brother. Yeah. And I think it's, 
also helpful to people to understand that, you know, first and foremost, we are organisms, we are humans, we are in this uh, mammal body and this technology, it doesn't like a car is not going to hug you. A house is not going to hug you. And human connection is fundamental. There's this energy exchange between when two people connect and it's euphoric. It feels wonderful. In my, in my opinion and experience, it's the best feeling in the world. And that, I think anyone who's felt that creates a sense where you want to live because you want that longer. You want to have that the next day. How many people have lost a loved one and said, I'll give anything to have them back just another day. Yet ask yourself, were you present when you had them in the first place or did you take their life for granted? Because that's a big part of regret too that we feel because you could, you could spend thousands of hours with people and never actually be with them to be present. And when you end up isolating yourself energetically or physically, you do feel alone. And when you get these lower states, then generally in the background, there's a, a desire to not want to be here, to not want to live. And the brain wants to accomplish whatever we're programming it to do. So if your focus in isolation for years on end is that you don't want to live, well, it's not a surprise that those individuals are going to generally have a shorter lifespan outside of accidents that take us, you know, not by a natural way, you know, you get hit by a car. Yeah. That happens. However, if you if you live without being in danger, then yeah, if you want to live, then you're generally going to live a while. And we see this even from surgery recoveries, people with illnesses. A lot of illnesses are created from a negative thought process. We also know that recovery from illnesses and surgeries is heavily dependent on where the mindset is of the person recovering. Wow. That's fascinating. Talk to me about you've got relationships in your life and you see this study and you're like, wow, this idea of social fitness, this is very important to me. And now we're kind of delving into the, the land of relationships, which is okay. Cause that's, that's from the study. We see that they are everything. You've got this person on a lower vibrational level, someone who is experiencing anger, yet you care about this person, right? You want to, you want to help this person. You want to be there. You want to maintain that relationship. How can you build up that relationship again without going down to that person's vibrational level? Yeah. Great question. And such a recent experience. <laughs> uh, first, it helps to get yourself out of the way. Uh, because oftentimes when there's something going on, if you are close to somebody, then something probably happened within you too. So first, you know, look at yourself and get yourself out of the way, clear yourself. And when you can start clearing yourself, you can see what's what's left. And and it's important to this goes back to being introspective and and truly getting a sense of where you're at consciously. This is why it helps to, to have the map of consciousness and understand that there is a spectrum of consciousness. Because when I was in that situation, the last thing I wanted to do was approach that person from anger. It just it doesn't work out well. And, and I won't do that. I'm not that person anymore. I have no interest. So it's being able to understand that person and where they're at truly, accept and love them. And how can I say this? Make that approach into the conversation as strong as possible, holding yourself in a, in a place of love and understanding. And also be ready to be with whatever is communicated, whatever it is. We have to be able to be with that and show that love and acceptance for what that person's sharing because it may not be something you like. And that's okay because that's being able to see your part in the situation or showing that emotional availability for that person. A lot of people grow up with people around them that are emotionally unavailable. And so a lot of people have this withholding of communication because of this fear of this unpleasant experience that a lot of times they don't even realize where it's tracked back to. And so the mind does a lot to protect itself from unpleasant experiences. We'll avoid conversations because it's going to be an unpleasant experience. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can build an understanding of ourselves and hold ourselves in a place of love, it allows us to be with conversations that maybe we never thought we could actually be with. You don't want to react from someone sharing. If you react, then there's something there for you. Wow. So, to, so you, yeah, you asked me, like, how can you be with someone who is in anger? Hold yourself in love and be with that person 
offer a non-judgmental opening. Sometimes you got to prompt it a little bit, push them a little bit. Uh, and how I mean, do you do that, by the way? Not to interrupt you because I love where you're going, but how do you prompt them, especially a person in such a tense emotional state? And maybe it's sadness, maybe it's anger, but a powerful emotion nonetheless. How do you prompt that with a non-judgmental opening? Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes share, call them out what you see that you already are aware of that helps them realize that you do get them and you see where they're at, you know, and you take that risk because if they're not communicating, then you're, you're making a, an inference that you hope is on the mark. Like, Hey, I, I know there's something around this bothering you, or I know there's something I did that you're angry about. So I already know that so there's no reason to hold back. And if you can just communicate with me, I can promise that I'm going to be okay with it because you want people to feel free to be able to communicate with you. And most people, they're scared of a reaction or how something's going to turn out. So you can just let them know. I know you're mad at me. I get that. It's okay. Can you communicate with me so that we can work, work on something? And you also have to be ready to work on yourself though. You can't, you can't have someone share something with you that they're mad about. And then turn it around and invalidate their emotion. That's the very yeah. reason why they end up being like that in the first place. So, you know, never invalidate someone's experience. It doesn't matter if you see it a different way. If they feel that way genuinely, then that's their experience. And then to be actively listening and be with that and say, oh, okay, that's how they saw me or that's how they see the world. And then, you know, there's deeper, it'd be harder to get into the deeper. Sure. No, I here. think that that's a great place to start though, because we all have to have those difficult conversations, whether we are a leader in the workplace or an executive and you're in the boardroom and you've, the emotions are high. It's your responsibility in that moment as the leader of that group to not react like what you said. And instead say, is it okay if I share what I'm seeing right now in this room? And they're going to say, well, yeah, please share. And then you share from the observer's standpoint, not from your own emotional standpoint. And for anyone who's been listening, who maybe, I mean, if you've listened this much, you probably don't think this, but if you've thought, well, how is this mindfulness stuff really going to help me? How is that meditation really going to help me? That's a real life situation. You're having a difficult conversation at work. You're having a difficult conversation with your spouse. You're having a conversation with your kids and their emotions are high. It's one thing to react and respond to them with a cry for help. It's another thing to stand back, free yourself from that situation and offer a loving response to help elevate that person's emotional point of view in that moment. Yeah. Practically, I would say, listen to receive instead of listening to respond. Wow. Yeah. Great advice. I love this stuff, man. This is really powerful. And I know that you, this is what you gel with. This is what you do. You work with people in business, people where emotions are frequently very high. So I, I'd like to ask you if, if you're willing to go into this, how do you work with people and who are the people that you love to work with the most in what you do with mindfulness? Yeah, I like, you know, I just got to ask this question a couple of days ago too. I like working with people who have, achieved success in their life yet are still trapped into the negative place that motivated them to get there in the first place so they yet they can't they can't actually be with and receive what they have and what they've done for themselves they keep beating themselves up i'd love to work with people that i can see to help them i like working with high performers uh because there's more value there they're going to be more in tuned into what i'm offering and then they're going to apply it and then they're going to see it as an investment because they're going to gain more in their life from it. And if I could give a character example to people where unfortunately uh, took their lives is one person that a lot of people I'm sure watching this will know is Twitch. That was on the Ellen show. That's my ideal client because I would love to have him still here and working with someone like that where I can help them process healthfully what's going on. So that doesn't happen or Aaron Carter, whose mm -hmm. body was found a few months ago, mm -hmm. you know, someone who has achieved so much in life yet is still battling with things here. And then, you know, what does, and these are big influencers. So now what does the world get from them? If they're able to benefit from that indirectly, their advocacy now of mindfulness will go much further than me. And, and that's how I see the system healing itself 
supporting each other. And so I would love to support people in those positions because I know how much further it's going to carry. Mindfulness works top down. Uh, so that's another thing I love about it. And there's other research and studies on what one enlightened mind does and how many people it affects per, you know, different vibrations and, and how it ripples through. So, I mean, we can do a lot if we start supporting each other because then people with the means you grow in compassion and you grow in empathy. And so there's naturally going to be a, a, a bigger giving in the world. And something that I, I started to see doing this research was that, you know, with all the intelligence and, and, and different views of people in the world, we, it's like we're looking for this answer, and I think we already have it. I think if, if you know, another 10% of minds were cleared and healed in this world, collectively, we definitely have the answer to, to having a sustainable and more harmonic world. There's just so many minds are, are functioning from survival, yet at least a third of this world is not in survival anymore. Beautifully said. For those people who haven't worked with a coach, you've mentioned to me that you are not telling people what to do, right? And a lot of people might think of coaching and therapy and they might say, what's the difference, right? You specifically mentioned to me that you like to, and correct me if I'm wrong, you like to be the mirror for people or hold the mirror for people. What does that mean? And at the same time, paint a picture of what it looks like to work with you on these different philosophies. Yeah, so I'll speak to the mirror part first. When I'm working with people, I always tell them that it's not me in the coaching session. So I call it zeroing out. And it's my practice of objective observation. And so there's no I, there's no, there's no subjective what I think they need to do. I'm merely reflecting what I'm observing. And recently, what I started doing is offering clients if they want a copy of the session notes, which uh, a handful have agreed like, yeah, I'd want to look at that. And so clients are seeing that when they go through these session notes, my capturing is merely of what's being said. There's mm. maybe three, four sentences of my own personal interpretation. And it's usually just highlighting, okay, we got to look back here again. Or this person said this and then they got emotional. Or, hey, they're doing great. I'm so happy for where they're going to go. There's not a box or a diagnosis I'm putting them in, uh, first and foremost. And then the second thing, I ask the two big questions I ask people is, what are the obstacles you're facing? And what is your best life? And everyone I work with, I let them know that's my compass. I'm not here how to tell you how to live life. What I'm here to do is support you for what you want in your life. So whatever you want, I'll support you there. However, doing this work, you may find that your wants start to change and maybe they're not what you thought you wanted. And that's okay because the answer is always going to come from you, not me. See, we'll realize this by ourselves just by doing the work. So everyone I work with sets their own compass heading and I support them to get there because it's about how they're functioning consciously, not about what their personal desire is in life. That's not for me to say. Everyone has their own preference of what they would want in life. Totally. I love that. And for those of you where that sounds great, you can contact Nick at his social profiles below. I've got Nick's LinkedIn. Is there another way that is great for people to contact you at? Uh, well, the website being one world.com, you can uh, message me there. That goes to my email. That's probably, uh, that's gonna be the best way or social LinkedIn, Facebook. I mean, my name is the same everywhere. Or if you look for being one world, uh, my, all the pages are that name. So it's either my name or the company's name and you'll, you'll find me. That's amazing. And sometimes a, a reminder can be the most helpful thing of all. And when you guys go to beingoneworld.com, that's Nick's website. It's in the description as well. You can sign up for Nick's newsletter. You just enter your email. You'll get his newsletter whenever he decides to send that out. And you'll open your email and you'll be like, oh, there's a reminder. I'm going to work today to be more present. I'm going to put forth some kind of mindfulness meditation and practice it for five minutes a day. And then maybe in a week, I'll increase it to seven minutes and then maybe 10 minutes. And then maybe you'll enjoy it so much that you're doing it for 30 minutes or an hour. Or you'll take the time in the park to do it. Whatever makes the most sense for you and your life. Join Nick's newsletter at being one world.com and start the conversation with Nick on social media, because I'm really happy that I started the conversation with you, Nick. And well, we started it together on Christine's, uh, 
networking and her connection with, with the two of us. So I'm grateful to have met you, brother. I love everything that you're doing. And I'm really happy that we could come together today and have this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would, would you mind if I shared just one last minute? Of, Please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This just came to mind, so I'm going to go with it. Uh, I haven't had any, every experience in life. However, I, I do understand what it is to be in low spots. And, you know, I had a mind that used to think constantly. I could not turn it off, and it was draining. And in my early 20s, I, I started to learn that drinking to excess would shut my mind off. And so that started being used to, to give me that relief. Uh, I've had times where I've experienced depression and didn't want to be here and, and thought a lot about it and researched many different ways to do it. And so I share that because I can't, I can't be happier at just the investment and the progress I've made in myself because I don't think like that anymore. And I do have a quiet mind and achieving a level of inner peace that I didn't even know was possible or the world wouldn't tell you was possible or, you know, certainly the medical side doesn't seem to advocate so much. So I share that because it's not just my story. If you talk to other people that practice this, if you ever talk to a monk, they were regular people at one point too, and they went on a little more of a extreme journey. Uh, and that can be your story too. So whatever ailments you're having, it, you, most minds can be healed and most people aren't really trapped. Most people do not have a brain where there's actual physical miswiring and chemicals off. It's just a, a imbalance of reality. So that's what I would offer as my closing statement. Beautifully said. That's a beautiful way to close. And I'm glad that you're still here, my friend. And look at where it's led us. I mean, this conversation that might help even just one person listening and the work that you're doing with all the incredible people that you're helping, like, thank God you're still here, man. And you're, you're only going to continue to reach more people. So Thanks for being on the show, Nick. I'm glad to be your friend and I look forward to the next time. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I appreciate this so much. It was wonderful. This was an awesome conversation that went in a lot of different directions. We talked about mindfulness. We talked about being in the present moment. We talked about the number one key to happiness that was studied by Harvard over the course of many, many, many decades that we shared. I hope that you took away one thing from this conversation. And I know that one thing will be different for everyone, depending on where you are in your journey right now. And if you did take away one thing, share this show with just one other person who could use this as well, where you know that when they listen to this conversation, then they're going to say, you know what? There is light ahead, right? Just like Nick said, there was a time where he didn't want to be here and look what he's doing now, right? Thank God he still is here. And you can find more about Nick at the social profile links in the description here as well as Nick's website, beingoneworld.com, where you can join his newsletter. You can send him a message if you want to have a conversation. And as always, I'm grateful that you are here. Thank you for being the best part of the Be Better team. And until we talk again next time, continue to be better.